Elite traders have incredible market vision that allows them to nail the market environment virtually each trading session. But did you know that this skill can be systematized to allow any dedicated trader to learn how to do it relatively easily? In this video, you'll learn the exact system from an amazing presentation one of our most seasoned traders did at our live sold out conference in New York City. I'm Mike Bellafiori, and we're one of the top proprietary trading firms located in New York City since 2005 and proud to have developed numerous seven and even eight figure per year traders. Watch, take notes, and learn from a professional trader on our trading desk so you can grow your trading account. So now that I've almost lost my voice from talking to so many amazing people last night and today, I'm gonna to give my presentation. Uh, market internals. So. I probably should have called this something else, actually. I've been thinking all day about this. I'm like, this is a terrible name for this presentation. I probably should have called it, you know, how to have a comprehensive bird's eye view of the entire market while you're trading, right? So something like that, because that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about having vision. Now, how many people here trade futures? Raise your hand. All right, so a lot of people. So how many of you who trade futures trade the market indices, right? The ES, the NASDAQ, or if you trade the Qs or SPY? OK, that's a lot of people. So how many, how many people trade individual names? Raise your hand if you trade stocks. Awesome, me too. Um, how about? Currencies. Anyone trade currencies? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. What about bonds? Anyone trade bonds? Yeah. Really? You do? All right. Well, now I know who the smartest person in the room is. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't matter what you trade. There's always a big picture element to it. So I want you to think back to Dr. S's talk this morning, right? It seems like a week ago at this point. <laughs> Think back to, to when he was talking about having a big picture understanding of the market, thinking about what big money is doing and how it's moving the market, who's in the market, right? He's looking at the NYSE tick, which is a market internal. And, you know, Dr. S actually taught me a lot about what I know about this stuff, okay? So many hours in his office picking his brain about what he knows about assessing the market, what he's learned from hedge funds, what he's picked up, right? And obviously it's a lot, as you guys saw this morning. So if you guys have any questions about this afterwards, don't ask me, ask Dr. S. Um, and then think back to Carlton's talk when he's talking about different market environments, right? And we go through phases where we have momentum and where things are moving, and we go through phases where the market consolidates, right? We have bear markets, we have bull markets, right? And, and Justin mentioned this too, right? This is a common thread I've noticed through everybody's speeches, right? Where we have these playbooks but sometimes these playbooks really, really work in a certain market environment. And sometimes they don't work in a certain market environment. So part of trading becomes understanding what environment we're in and which playbooks to dust off, right? You might not have traded this setup for a while, but now we're in a bear market, right? Or now we're cratering because of coronavirus. So there's going to be different dynamics going on. And so the reason that I watch these market internals is because I want to know, to the best of my ability, and, and quickly and accurately, right, without spending too much energy understanding it, what's happening in the overall market. Because unlike some of you who trade futures, I'm not trading the overall market every day. But I might be trading an NVIDIA breakout. I might be hawking you know, a short in SMCI or looking for Microsoft to make a move. And 
I mean, how many people here have been looking for, say, that Microsoft breakout, right? And it makes a little move off the open, and it looks strong for a second, and you're so sucked in to the ticker that you're trading that you don't realize that you know, 80% of the NASDAQ, NASDAQ stocks are down on the day, right? That consumer staples are the strongest sector in the market. Semiconductors are weak. And that, you know, probably because of all of these things together compre comprehensively, it's probably not the day for Microsoft. So even if you don't trade the indices, I think that this stuff is really useful. I think it's especially useful when you're trading individual names. And then when everything aligns sometimes, I will trade the indices, right? When we get the signs of a trend day, or if we get into an environment like COVID, where all of a sudden now volatility is high and everything's correlated and everything's trading together. So now we can trade the indices, and Steve mentioned this, right? Like when, when volatility is elevated, correlation is high, ranges are bigger, right? Everything's doing the same thing and everything's trading extreme ATRs then you know, trade SPY, right? But that's, that's a normal situation in that environment. And so what I want to do is I want to talk a lot about this market that we're in right now. Because I know that some of you have seen some of the videos that we've done on market internals. I don't want to spend too much time defining these things because there's videos that go into detail defining them. I will, for those of you who don't know. But I really want to apply this to the market that we're in. So let's just start off with what are market internals, right? So it kind of is what it sounds like. It's looking inside the market in different ways to see what's happening, OK? And rather than just looking at the price chart of SPY or the price chart of the NASDAQ. We're looking at the individual names. We're looking at the breadth. Right, that's the, that's the first thing. And that's measuring participation. We want participation behind a move if we're going to look for follow through. We want most of the stocks to be participating in this move if we want a broad market rally. Right, and we're going to talk about kind of what this means in this market as well. The other thing we look at is tone. All right, tone is the risk appetite in the market on any given day, right? And this will go back and forth, right? Sometimes the risk appetite is high, right? Growth stocks are breaking out. Bitcoin is running. And maybe consumer staples, which is a safer, safer group, is lagging behind, right? That's an example of when there's risk appetite in the market and we get a certain kind of tone for the day. And one of the things we look at always are the market themes and the leadership, because that's going to tell us a lot about the tone, how those leaders are acting, right, based on the theme that's happening in the market. So what's the theme right now that's been happening all year? Anyone know? AI. Yeah, AI. Semiconductors, right? So I could probably just end this talk right now and just be like, watch NVIDIA every day. <laughs> <laughs> but that's this environment. And so sometimes we get into different environments where that's not the case, OK? So can anyone guess out of these things what seems to be the most important thing in this environment right now? Right? Is it, is it market breadth? Or is it the tone? Yeah. Yeah. And not, not that breadth isn't important. Like, I'm look, it's everything together that I'm looking at. But I get a lot of questions because I'll talk about these market internals. And people will come to me and they'll say, but the VOLD ratio was 2. And I tried to get long, you know, and how, how come, like, the market didn't do anything. And it's everything together. Right? These are just variables. Right? And any time we're looking at variables in the market, we're, we're just taking in information. It's just math. Right? 
And it's important because every single trade has variables, like you just saw from Max, right, outlining like his, his amazing trades, right? And it's like, he's not a quant, he's not doing anything you know, fancy like that, but he still has very, very specific trade variables for all of his trades, right? And so that's what these are. These are environmental variables. Now, just because we have a variable now and we can look and, and have a, see a value, it could be two, it could be three, and I'll go over these in a second, does not mean that there's a trade. And I really want to emphasize that. Sometimes these market internals are telling me that the market is choppy and it's probably going to do nothing and, and I should probably either find something in play, right, or I should go do some coding or something like that, right? So it, just because we know this stuff and can read the market doesn't mean, right, that we're going to try to find, figure out every turn in the market. Like our job as traders is not to predict every move Right? It's not to just figure out the market completely. If that, I mean, that's, that's so impossible, right? To know everything that's going to happen. So that's not what this is about, right? Our job as traders is to wait for when things are extremely clear to us based on our playbook. And when those things become very clear, we put the appropriate risk on, and then we manage the trade according to our rules. So let's talk about market breadth first. And I'm going to define these fairly quickly and then get into examples, because I know that most of you probably want to just get into some examples from this year and just talk about that stuff, right? So we're going to talk about market breadth first. And there's a hierarchy to how I look at this stuff. So there are three things that we look at. And they're right here on the screen. So I start with the VOLD ratio, right? And this is the foundation for everything. This is the main context, OK? And we're going to define this in a second, right? The advanced decline line, right? That's the most dynamic market internal. And it's going to highlight when the VOLD ratio might be subject to changing or whether it's going to hold. And then we have the tick, which is going to be the most immediate and reactive market in turn. So let's talk about the VOLD ratio. So the VOLD ratio is the total volume of the up stocks in the market divided by the total volume of the down stocks in the market. Okay. And the way I look at this is it's kind of like the RVOL for the overall market. Right? If you look at SPY in the queues, usually you're not going to see a lot of RVOL. Right? It's such a thick instrument that you're not going to get the same kind of RVOL readings that you're going to get on, a, on an AMD or NVIDIA or something like that. And so when I look at the VOLD, I'm looking for it to paint a picture for is the market in play? And is there heavy selling or heavy buying in the market, or is it neutral? Okay, So I look at, it, at the actual value of this, and extremes matter. So anything over 3 gets into the extreme area. Anything below negative 3 right, to the downside. right? So if it's negative 3, for example, that means there's three times as much volume flowing into the down stocks on the day as there are up stocks. And we're looking at the NICE exchange, or we're looking at the NASDAQ exchange. If it's 5, positive 5, that means there's five times as much volume flowing into the up stocks than there are the down stocks. Okay? And this is going to be the slowest market internal to change. So while it's the most powerful and sort of contextual variable, if the market completely reverses, the VOLD is going to sort of be like the last to the party. So like I like to think of it like if you play chess, the king is like the most important piece, but like it, it has a tough time moving, right? So here's some examples. So here, here's some examples from this year, OK? This was a very extreme VOLD reading day, OK? We had like negative 10 to negative 25. And I think somebody came to me today and actually brought up this day. Now, this is not a trend day, and not all of these are trend days, right? A lot of times on trend days, 
all of these things are aligning and we can really capture these moves. But sometimes we're just seeing se heavy selling in the market and we're not getting a trend day. We just know that there's heavy selling in the market. And so on a day like this, when we take out highs in the morning and we're seeing negative 10 volt readings, an extreme number to the downside, there's no way I'm paying through highs of the morning for a breakout, thinking that we're going to like fill the gap to the upside. And if it, you know what, if that happens, I'm going to miss the trade and I'm, I'm totally okay with that, right? And again, I might not be trading the market on this day, but this is letting me know that overall, there's a lot of selling pressure in the market. And this is a five-day picture, okay? Um, you can see the extremeness of it just looking at the five-day picture, okay? So here's another day. We get a gap down, right? And on any gap down, and this is a sizable one, we can expect to have extreme negative vold readings because most stocks should be red, right? And if we get a big gap, there should be a lot of volume flowing into those stocks. So what happens here? We open up, and the vold reading is completely neutral. And in fact, it actually hold, starts to hold positive while it's still in that opening range. And so a lot of times when this happens, and you're looking for continuation to the downside, and you see that the vold is completely neutral, there's barely any reason for the market to be down at this point. And of course, in this case, it does break that opening range to the upside. Often it will fill the gap or trade back up to two-day view app, which it did here. So this is a situation where we get a gap, and we don't see that extreme breadth. Here's an extreme positive breadth day. And we try to break lows, and we can't go lower, and we reclaim. Again, it's not a trend day. And I wanted to show these because I like to show really clean, opportunistic days when it comes to the internals. And I do this a lot in some of the videos we've done. But I really want to show how sometimes in trading, things are less clear. And just because we have a lot of information doesn't mean there's a trade. So like for instance, on this day, when we have really strong VOLD readings, that means three to four and a half times as, many, as much volume is flowing into the up stocks than, there, than volume flowing into the down stocks on this day. So when we take out lows, if I was looking somehow for a short because of price action, thinking, OK, now we're breaking lows, like let me get short, I'm going to see that VOLD ratio and say, you know what, Garrett, like, don't, don't make up a trade. Like, what are you doing? Like, most stocks are up right now. Like, there's the volume is all to the upside, right? So that's, to me, that's, that would keep me from getting in trouble. And of course, we have our classic beautiful trend day with extreme bold readings all day, and it builds throughout the day, and a lot of them look like this. All right, so the advanced decline line. This is going to be fast moving. The patterns are going to matter, right? And this is the difference between the number of up stocks and the number of down stocks. So it doesn't take into account volume, and it doesn't include a ratio. It's just subtraction. You're just subtracting the up stocks from the down stocks. How many more stocks are up or down? One of the patterns that I really like to see on this on a trend day is when it's pinned to positive 2,000 or negative 2,000, which is a very extreme reading. So it's not just extreme. It's pinned there, and it won't move. And I'll show an example of that. And then the inverse, of course, is when it opens really strong and gets unpinned immediately and trades all the way back to neutral in the first like half hour. That's a big tell on a gap that we might not get a trend day. So here's that same really weak VOLD day, but here's the advanced decline, and it's stuck at like negative 2,000 all day. All right, and you can see how extreme that is. All right, that's not the kind of day where I'm going to be going long. And then here we have that same gap down where we open up with pretty positive advanced decline readings where I'm not going to be playing for continuation to the downside. 
And again, we have that same strong advanced decline day where we can't break down. And here we have our trend day, positive 1,500. All right, so the tick, the difference between the number of stocks trading on an uptick and trading on a downtick. This is an immediate indicator telling us how much selling or buying pressure is in the market right now. And we can look at patterns here as well. Holding above zero or holding below zero is what I love to see on a trend day. It's a huge tell. It's very rare, but sometimes it will hold above zero all day on an uptrend day. And you'll get a few of those ticks maybe below and right back up. Right? We can also see changes of character in the market through ticks. And of course, we want to see extreme ticks, right? consistent positive 1,000 ticks to the upside or consistent negative 1,000 ticks to the downside. And like Dr. S said, if you get those negative ticks consistently but price can't go down, you do often see a reversal back to the upside. Right? So this is just extra information. So here's the tick with a cumulative tick below it, which I, which I really like to put on my charts because it helps me understand when where generally the tick is trading, right? So if it's trending to the downside, that cumulative tick, those bars down there, they're building out to the downside. That means that the tick is generally holding below zero. And you can see this point in time during the day where after we took out the high and failed to go higher, the tick then held below zero extremely cleanly on, on that entire down move. OK, and then we had that little rally into the close where you can see the tick change character. And here's a day that I wanted to throw in because it's so interesting to me. And you'll see this sometimes. We were having a completely neutral day. The tick is just above and below zero, no extremes, nothing's happening in the market. And then there was no news on this day. And all of a sudden, we break lows. And the, look at the tick. So as soon as we break lows, we're getting negative 1,500 ticks, which is an extreme tick. And they sustain, right? So on a normal day, if we just kind of break lows, like I'm not going to hit lows in the market. But now that the tick is acting this way, like something's going on, right? So now all of a sudden, it's holding below zero. Those ticks back up to zero when they fail. You know, if you're a scalper, that's something that you can use to find those entries, those pullbacks in that downtrend in the afternoon as the market breaks down. And of course, like here's the classic trend day example of the tick. This is my favorite thing. This is like a thing of beauty. <laughs> I like dream of these at night. <laughs> I mean, look, look at how many ticks are below zero. It's like barely any. I mean, that's real buying pressure all day long. And it doesn't always look like this. So when it does, I think that that adds an incredible amount of edge to a trade. If you bought this at the open, you might use that as a variable in order to hold the trade, right? Turn it into a trade to hold. If you buy it in the afternoon, you will have seen all of this information leading up to this point, knowing that if I buy this afternoon consolidation, in order for a move into the close to close at highs, the tick needs to continue holding zero as it's done all day long. And here's another example. And you can probably barely tell that I changed the slide because they, they all look the same. And that's, that's what's so great about these. All right, so tone. Let's, this is the big thing right now. I already talked about how it's all about risk appetite, right? And the way we do this is we look at leadership, we look at themes, and we look at offensive sectors versus defensive sectors. So think back to what Dr. S was saying about rotation in the market, right? Like what's in play? What, air, what groups are in play? What sectors are in play? Where is money rotating in and out of? A lot of that can tell us about the tone, and I, don't want to have to look at 20 different spider ETF charts and try to figure out, you know, like a fund manager, like exactly 
what's happening with all these ETFs, right? Because I'm trading my setups. Like I'm trading an individual stock that has its own setup, its own variable, and it might be affected by the market. So I want to create indicators that tell me instantly what's going on because I don't want to spend too much energy worrying about all this stuff that, that is affecting my trade. So let's talk about some of this stuff. So one of the things that I like to do is I use an ETF filter. All right, and I, I also like to use an offense defense line, which I'll show you in a second. I'll show you how I built it. And then of course I look at individual names. Super simple, right? Don't need an indicator for that. So why do I look at the market ETF filter? What groups are driving the market, right? That's, I want to know what's in play. Is it semiconductors? Right? Especially right now. I want to know what the offensive sectors are doing, and I'll go over those in a second. I want to know what the defensive sectors are doing, and I'll go over that in a second. And of course, we have our thematic asset class ETFs, too, that we can track that change depending on the market environment. So this is a simple breakdown of these. There are more, but this is sort of a simplified version. And I'll show you my ETF filter in a second. But it's pretty simple, right? We look at growth stocks, we look at technology, we look at semiconductors, consumer discretionary, right? the stuff people buy when they have extra money. These are all risk on offensive industries. right? When the economy is great, when there's risk appetite in the market, people are going to be buying semiconductors and tech stocks and growth stocks. So on the flip side of that, the defensive sectors like utilities, Consumer staples, right? The stuff that people buy all the time, no matter what, like toilet paper and toothpaste and stuff like this, right? Like if you know, if you're trying to buy a Microsoft breakout and you look, and it's a, it's the toilet paper and toothpaste companies leading the market to the upside. You know, it's there's, it's it's time to like think about maybe if today's the day for Microsoft, right? So we can also look at thematic asset classes, and these change depending on the market environment. But of course, as Dr. S pointed out, and I think a few others, that you know, for a few years now, it's been all about rates. right? So we can look at bonds. We can look at the actual rates. We can look at the dollar. Dr. S went over that. Um, these are all things that can tell us what's happening in the market. right? So if rates are ripping, Consumer staples are ripping, right? Bonds are cratering, the dollar's ripping, and I'm like so obsessed with like Nvidia going higher because I've been looking at it for two weeks. Like, you know, and it upticks. Like, if I'm just too zoomed in on Nvidia, like I'm just not gonna I'm not gonna have all this information and I might just be getting torn up, like just trying to buy Nvidia because you know I think it's eventually going higher. So here's my ETF filter. I, I take a basket of ETFs. It's going to be more ETFs than you're probably going to want to use, and you can just use the ones that I just went over. I sort them by RVOL to see what's in play. So if like semiconductors are in play, if tech is in play, I want to know that. If right, I, I, I sort them by percent change from open, so I can see what's the strongest today. Like what since the open, what is getting bought, what is getting sold. Right? Like, like Dr. S said, like, what are those funds doing? What's the big money doing? And then, of course, absolute change, which tells me what is making the biggest moves. So I'm going to show you a bunch of days, some we've looked at, some we haven't, from this year. And these aren't perfect days, because this is the market we're in, in terms of all of these variables. But I'm going to highlight how I read the market on these days. So. Here we have a day that it wasn't a, a powerful, strong uptrend, but it was a trend day, right? It opened at the lows, it closed at the highs. So, I mean, it's a, right, it's, the bold is, is negative. Um, the advanced decline was like, okay, right? It's nothing crazy. So what, what was happening on this day? So I tweeted out at 10.02 that you know, breath is not that great today, probably because of IWM, but be aware that this is a mega cap 
tech day. So look at Meta and Amazon for tone. Meta and Amazon had earnings on this day. They both reported tremendous earnings reports, and they were gapping way up. And they were holding their gaps, right? And in this market, tone is everything. Here was my ETF filter on that day at 1017. Technology is the strongest sector in the market, and it's doing Arval. QQQ is up there, SMH is up there, and of course, XLC is up there with, with Meta. So we have a risk on tone in the ETF filter. We have individual names like Meta breaking to all-time highs on incredible volume. Amazon breaking to new highs on higher than average volume and following through. And then to throw into the mix, NVIDIA breaking out of a five-day range. So while the breadth wasn't that great, this was all happening. And so in this market, this rally has been on fairly narrow breadth, but with incredible leadership, which has been enough. And so that's why the tone is so important. That's why we watch these leaders and we keep track of the ETFs. So one of the ways that you can do this is to look at the Magnificent Seven. And there's an ETF called MAGS that you can track to do this. I wouldn't trade this, it's too thin, but I would look at it as an indicator. And what you can do, and of course, Magnificent Seven, you know, the seven mega caps, right? We should probably kick uh, Apple and Tesla out of it pretty soon, but, you know, it's the, the seven. And then you compare it to VTI, which is all the stocks in the market. And you can put them on a relative strength line on any given day, and this is that same day, and you can see that MAGS was extremely stronger than the rest of the market on this day. So offense versus defense, how do we do this? I showed you those offensive sectors and the defensive sectors. So what I'll do is I'll take the three offensive sectors and I'll turn them into one ETF, right? You can just add them up and then take the defensive sectors and turn them into an ETF of themselves and you just add those up and then you divide one by the other and you get a line and you can actually Normalize this with, with ATRs to make it even more accurate if you want. But that's a little bit besides the point. And you combine them each together to make an offense versus defense line, where if the line is above zero, offensive sectors are outperforming defensive sectors and vice versa. Right? You plot them against each other. So here's the line, and here's that same day. And we can just see that the offensive sectors as a whole were outperforming the defensive sectors, OK? And of course, we watch individual names, right? We, we track the current theme, as you guys already said. It's AI, it's semiconductors in this market. What are the market leaders? So we look at NVIDIA, we look at Meta, we look at, you know, at the SMCIs of the world. And um, you know, even, even something like ASML that I, don't, that I don't trade a lot other than on earnings. Um, is a, is a good proxy because it's one of the biggest semiconductor stocks that's sort of leading this charge, right? So here are a bunch of days, and we'll look at everything together now. We'll kind of bring it all together. So on the right is a five-minute chart of two days showing the VOLD histogram and the advanced decline. And then on the left is an intraday two-minute chart with the tick. So this is the same day, and this is how I look at the internals every day. Like, this is my screen. So here we have a day where we have pretty strong VOLD ratio, right? Actually, very strong, 3 to 4. And we have an advanced decline that's rising, starts out fairly neutral, but quickly gets to like 1,500, 2,000. So very strong advanced decline and a very strong tick. So this is the ingredients of a trend day. Often, this is exactly what we'll see when we get a trend day. And to me, like this is where big opportunity comes in trading the overall market. Or trading a breakout in an individual name while this is happening. And so what else was happening on this day? Well, this is the NVIDIA 500 breakout that everybody was talking about today. So I'm actually going to be trading this 
on a day like this. And if we're talking about tone, like this was, this is the tone for the day. Is NVIDIA breaking out? Massive breakout, right? And it's kind of like a chicken or the egg thing. Like, did the market rip because this happened? Or, you know, maybe, right? But we had everything. We had NVIDIA breaking out, and we had all the internals. We had tone, we had the internals, we had everything. So here's another day, and to me this is less clear. And this kind of goes back to like, we don't have to trade everything. We don't have to always like make perfect sense of things. But there was enough information to figure it out on this day. So the VOLD was like kind of negative in the morning. The advanced decline was like kind of negative, And then they shaped up into the afternoon. The tick was messy until the afternoon. Right? The morning was very confusing. And this was a trend day, but very confusing in terms of the overall breadth of the market. But what was happening on this day? SMCI breaking out. And six other growth mega cap tech stocks and ETFs were breaking out to new 52-week highs on this day. So again, the tone is huge in this market. And just tracking these leaders and what they're doing has been informing these trend days in the overall market. And of course, if we look at the offense-defense line on the same day, we're getting the same picture, where the offensive sectors are outperforming the defensive sectors. So technology is leading the way, and nobody's buying utilities and toilet paper. And then, of course, there's like one more day. This is a little bit better. At least everything's positive. Still a little bit messy, right? If I were to cherry pick you guys like an amazing trend day, like it would just, everything would be perfect, right? I can show you a million of these. But I'm just showing you stuff from this year because I really want to show that like when trading, like not everything is always perfect. But we do have enough information, right? The tick is doing great on this day, by the way. But you know, the other stuff's a little messy, but what else was happening? Amazon was breaking out to 52-week highs. Microsoft was breaking out to new highs. NVIDIA was breaking out to new highs. SMCI was breaking out to new highs. And of course, the offense-defense line was positive from the open and just climbing. So again, the tone was there. This was a risk-on environment, right? One more day, bad open, shaped up really quickly. What was happening? XLK was breaking out. SMH was breaking out. And this is kind of interesting to see, too. Like XLU, one of the defensive sectors, down on the day, not doing anything. XLP, the consumer staples, unchanged. All right, a little gap down. And of course, the OD line was positive on this day. Really, what we're doing here is just creating a compass for ourselves like while we're trading. Because I mean, I can't tell you how many times like I've just had my head down, especially when I started out. And like you pick your head up at the end of the day, and you're like, I just missed like a market-wide tailwind, right? Like I'm, I'm so obsessed with like shorting this one name that I had an idea for in the morning, that I look back and I'm like, oh my god, like you know, tech broke out, the market had an uptrend day, everything was strong, and I'm sitting here like trying to, I'm, I'm trying to execute my short idea for the day, right? So even if you don't trade futures, trade the overall market. Even if you have no interest in trading the overall market, I would encourage you know, finding some way to get a bird's eye view on this kind of stuff, because it's really helped me. It helps our team. Um, we all use this stuff every day. We're communicating about it. And I've even put some of this stuff into algorithms as an overlay to help improve in certain environments. And so. When we talk about how tone is so important right now, in COVID, the breadth was huge, right? Because when the COVID crash is happening and everything is correlated and volatility is high, then the breadth becomes a huge indicator because it's really not any one individual name that's like leading the market. It's like the whole market's doing the same thing. So we're seeing historic breadth readings to the downside on the way down day after day after day. So now you get that gap down, and there's like neutral breath, and you're like, whoa, OK, that's different. right? And then you get that first positive breath day, and you just get that huge relief. 
rally, right? So that's an example of a market where breadth really matters. And when we back test this stuff, it can really help improve models in difficult environment, volatile environments like that. But right now, I would encourage everyone to like track the tone like we kind of laid out and stuff like that. Every market's different. And so I just track this stuff every day, and I review it, and I keep it in a notion. And that allows me to go back through and study this stuff and study how the market's changing. Questions? So I've been using the ETF filter pretty regularly. And sometimes um, there's a nuance. And is that the reason you, you started putting that into an advanced decline to get more of a binary answer? So it's like more definitive? Because sometimes you'll get like some of the, you know, two, of, two offensive and then maybe arc or, you know, this kind of thing happens. It's kind of a, a yeah. above the line or below the line. Right. Yeah, so it kind of goes back to the whole thing of, and we, I feel like a lot of us have said this in a different way. I really appreciated how Carlton was explaining this, but things are not always clear. Just because we have variables and we're good at tracking things, like does not mean that things are aligning. It can be messy, right? You could have tech and consumer staples leading on one day, and everything in the middle, right? And there are neutral breadth days where probably Seth is probably the only one here of us who would be crushing these days because he's putting on like iron condors and stuff because the market's gonna be a shit mess, right? <laughs> so, you know, just because like things aren't perfect, like doesn't mean, you know, there's something wrong with it. It just means that, okay, like, you know what? Either it's not clear to me or you know, we might just be having like a neutral kind of day where you know, we just might be in a range. So you're an active trader, not doing as well as you want, not doing as well as you deserve, and you just can't figure out why you can't become profitable no matter how hard you try. Well, let me show you why. This is your competition, the traders in this room. This room right here is full of elite traders, some of whom are making seven, and even eight figures a year. In fact, our top guys have made nearly 20 million each in net trading profits in a single year. Let's head to my office so I can share more. So you're probably used to seeing videos of lavish trader lifestyles, trading gurus, trading off of a laptop for an hour a day, heck, maybe even 15 minutes a day, and then them relaxing on some secluded beach for the rest of the day. Well, all I can tell you is that our traders train like pro athletes. They live and breathe the markets and are continually working on their trading skills. Because at our firm, that's what we found it really takes to make it in this game. I'm Mike Bellafiori, co-founder and managing partner of SMB Capital, one of the world's top proprietary trading firms located in Midtown Manhattan. And we're always looking for trading talent to hire and develop. And not just to trade in-house on our desk, but also to trade from their own home entirely using our firm's capital. And we have numerous traders doing just that, allowing them to make upwards of seven figures trading the firm's capital without risking their own money. But to even get a shot at something like that, you need to have the right training. That's why we're doing a new free online presentation in which we share how you can get an interview with SMB to become an in-house or remote trader, trading firm capital without risking yours and getting access to all of our firm's coaching and resources. And the best part, you don't have to be a profitable trader yet. In fact, we prefer to mold profitable traders with our methods and our techniques. That's why we have just three simple criteria that can earn anyone an interview. We're looking for highly ambitious and determined traders who fit our culture first and foremost. So if you believe that could be you, sign up for the free one hour online presentation by clicking the link that's in your top right corner of your screen now.